joy to see all of you love on each other. It's wonderful. <laughs> and now we get to hear from Pastor Clint Abbott and welcome him to our church. Uh, thank you, Maureen. <laughs> Good morning. good morning really 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 good to be here and uh, I am here through the connection of our common friend Judy Maxson uh, Judy and I got to know each other we well let me rephrase this Judy and I have known each other for 31 years when I was um, all the time uh, just a real quick sketch and if you're wondering I have this bulldog somebody asked me about that um, I'm a fair state bulldog alumnus um, Graduated, started out my career teaching high school, and then my second year of high school felt God's call to enter the ministry. And so back to Bible college, and so I worked a full time, uh, left the teaching field, and I worked in the private sector in business as a uh, computer um, programmer manager at a firm in Sparta called PACSAC. And I was there from 86 to 97 while I was going to Bible college. Took me, uh, you know, cram that five-year degree into, you know, 11, 12 years. And uh, some of you know how that can be. And, but, and Judy came on board in 88, so I've known Judy for 31 years. And it's uh, uh, been a joy to uh, keep in touch with her over the years as I've been out in ministry. And so I've uh, been in pastoral ministry, actually started pastoral ministry in 1994. Um, so anyway, all that being said, good to be here and glad to share uh, my wife, Michelle, glad to have her here. With She always travels with me. And uh, this is what I do right now. I've pastored in different types of churches. I have pastored um, existing churches. I have pastored what we call turnaround churches, where there's a church that might be struggling and needs some direction, and you give it vision and direction and turn them around. And then I, we have uh, been in church planting, having planted two churches. And so right now we're in a season of just... Uh, um, trying to figure out maybe where God, what the next open door that God has for us. I'm teaching part-time, semi-retired, teaching part-time at the Potter's House High School in Wyoming. I teach Bible and I teach economics. So hopefully the Bible will come through good today and I'll be light on the econ, all right? <laughs> so, um, so having been around a while, um, I developed this philosophy of life. In fact, I heard this and whenever I hear something from another minister, teacher, or whatever, and if, if I really think it's uh, very special, and I want to keep it, I laminate it. I have laminated this, okay? So this is called my philosophy of life. Maybe you can relate with me on this. Uh, when God created the dog, he said, sit all day by the door of your house and bark at everyone who comes in or walks past, for this will give you a lifespan. I will give you a lifespan of 20 years. The dog said, that's a long time to be barking. How about only 10 years and I give you back the other 10? And God agreed. When God created the monkey, he said, entertain people, do tricks and make them laugh. For this, I will give you a 20-year lifespan. The monkey said, monkey tricks for 20 years? That's a pretty long time to perform. How about I give you back 10 like the dog did? And God agreed. And when God created the cow, he said, you must go into the field with the farmer all day long and suffer under the sun, have calves, give milk to support the farmer's family. For this, I will give you a lifespan of 60 years. The cow said, that's kind of tough a life you want me to live for 60 years. How about 20? And I give you back the other 40. And God agreed again. So when God created man, he said, eat, sleep, play, marry, and enjoy yourself. For this, I'll give you 20 years. But the man said, only 20 years? Could you possibly give me 20? And then the 40 that the cow gave back, the 10 that the monkey gave back, and the 10 that the dog gave back. That makes 80 years, okay? Okay, said God, and he agreed. So that's why for the first 20 years, we eat, sleep, play, and we enjoy ourselves. For the next 40 years, we slave in the sun to support our family. For the next 10 years, we do monkey tricks to entertain the grandchildren. You see it coming. And for the last 10 years, we sit on the front porch and bark at everything that goes by. Huh? So, a philosophy of life. Now, uh, having said that, we'll get into some deeper things here. You, if you have Bibles, you might want to turn to Acts chapter 11. Uh, if you don't, I see it's also reprinted in the bulletin as well. and You can follow that along. And as you're turning there or opening that up, so this, this whole thing about a philosophy of life 
is I have tried to be an encouraging person. That's just the way I'm wired. That's the way God has made me. Many years ago, when, and back in the middle 90s, when vision statements and mission statements were coming in, and they were very popular, I know we were challenged to write a personal vision statement, and mine was to be an encourager of people. And that's what I really want to share with you about. Uh, because, you see, I really don't like the negativity that goes on. We have a lot of negativity, particularly this time in our world. There's an extreme amount of negativity. But people get locked into these scripts, you know. Like, I hear people say, like, on Monday morning, oh, it's Monday. Or how many have heard, back to the treadmill, all right? You know, that type of thing. And, 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 we, and we get locked in sometimes this negativity. And yet I was challenged uh, many years ago about uh, this whole philosophy of life and being an encouraging person is if you want to uh, be this kind of a person, depending on what kind of person you want to be, what you do is look ahead at your funeral and what people might say at your funeral about you, and what they might write as an epitaph, a saying on your tombstone, and then go back and live your life toward that. That used to be something uh, that was uh, shared with us in management back in the day. And so, you know, Barnabas uh, was an encouraging person, and I'm going to talk about him in just a minute, but let me talk about epitaphs, what people might say about you. What would you have people say about you? Um, here's one that I found was uh, about Ben Franklin. It says, the body of Ben Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, uh, the contents uh, torn and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here, food for worms, but the work shall not be lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more elegant edition, revised and corrected by the author. Now, that was a very elegant thing that uh, was said about Ben Franklin on his tombstone. Frank Sinatra has said, the best is yet to come. John Quincy Adams has said, this is the last of earth, I am content. Alexander the Great, a tomb now suffices him for whom the world was not enough. And then I found some rather interesting ones in a Georgia cemetery. I told you I was sick, was on the tombstone. <laughs> Uh, one said, here lies my wife, here lies she, hallelujah, hallelujah. Um, then there was another one that said, the children of Israel wanted bread, so the Lord gave them manna. Old clerk Wallace wanted a wife, and the devil gave him Anna. Uh, oh, I hope there's no Annas here. Uh, here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. And of course, one of my favorite is, uh, with a little western to it, here lays Butch. We planted him in the raw. He was quick on the trigger, but slow on the draw. Um, so what might be said about you? What would people say about you? And how is it we can be, uh, learn to be an encouraging person? And what can we learn from Barnabas? Let's take a look at the book of Acts, chapter 11. Let me read this for you. It says, Now those who had been scattered by their persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, traveling as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Now, this is the early disciples. They're being persecuted. They're being spread out. This is the book of Acts. Verse 20, some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw that the grace, what the grace of God had done, he was glad and he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people, the disciples, were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, Barnabas is just an interesting person in the Bible, one of my favorite. Barnabas uh, was, was there at the time when the, uh, the apostles were, when, for example, when they had to choose a replacement back in Acts chapter 1 and 2 to replace Judas, who hung himself. Uh, they had to replace him, and Justice and Matthias were two men that were considered, and they chose Matthias. The lot came upon Matthias. 
And Barnabas could have very well been considered, but he wasn't considered. And he could have felt like he was overlooked, but Barnabas never had that attitude. You don't get that from Barnabas in the scripture. You see that he was an encourager. He was glad. He was a positive person. In fact, um, here's what I think we can learn from Barnabas' life. It says it right here. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. So let's just kind of break that down a little bit for just a minute this morning to think about our lives and what we, what we might learn from Barnabas. But it says he was a good man. He did the right thing. He was generous with his time, with his talent, with his treasure. The word good there, it means choice, excellence. I mean, this man, he had integrity. You know, we get our word integrity from the integer, meaning wholeness. He had a wholeness about his life, and he just did the right thing. No matter what, he had this high level of integrity. Reminds me of the story of this fabulous rich man as he was lying dying. He summoned his three most trusted friends, his doctor, his priest, and his lawyer. And they got together, and he says, I know they say you can't take it with you, but I'm going to try. He then distributed three identical and very thick packages to each of his friends. And uh, it contained, each envelope contained $10 million of cash. And he says, what I want you to do is when my time has come at my funeral, when they lower me, my casket down, I want you to throw the packages into and I'll take it with me, okay? So each friend promises to do this. So in due, in due course of time, the rich man passes away, the friends show up at the funeral, the, the casket is going down, they throw pack, three packages into the grave, and now they're walking back out to the parking lot discussing their friend when finally one, the doctor, decides he needs to confess something. He says, you know, I was thinking the other night about how the church could, or the, uh, the, the uh, hospital could really use this new wing, and $10 million would go a long way instead of in the ground. So I kept the $10 million, and we've used it at the hospital, and what I put in the ground was just a bunch of newspaper in the envelope. The lawyer could not believe it. He says, you have violated, uh, you have created a fiduciary, you violated a fiduciary trust. Why, this could be a felony. My goodness. And, and while he's just beside himself and he can't believe it, the priest says, now just a second. He says, um, I too have a confession to make. I was in the church office the other night, and I was just thinking how we could really use that $10 million to add a soup kitchen on and the benefits of the community. And so I used the $10 million for that, and what I threw under the grave was an envelope full of newspaper. Now the attorney, he just can't believe it. He is just like blowing a head gasket. He is just like out of it. He just says, I can't believe it. He says, you now have only committed possibly a felony, you violated a fiduciary trust, but you've broken the promise to a trusted friend. You should have done what I did. I took the $10 million and put it in my safe in my office, and that is right where it is safe, and I wrote a check for $10 million, and that's what <laughs> I threw into the thing. All right, so integrity, doing the right thing, the right choice. Barnabas was a good man because he had integrity in his life and he made the right choice. And that's the first thing that I see in Barnabas' life. Now, the second thing I see is that Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit. That's what it says. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. That filled with the Holy Spirit... Uh, when you read like Ephesians 5.18, Ephesians 5.18 is the only passage in Scripture where the Apostle Paul uses what we call imperative language, like a military command. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? He doesn't talk about when, you're, when you accept Christ to be your Savior, that the Holy Spirit comes within you to uh, gift you and to guide you and all of that. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And of course, what he's saying is, allow the Holy Spirit to control your life to guide your life. And he says in that passage, in fact, he says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he uses that, that, that uh, 
illustration to say, well, just like wine, like too much alcohol will take a person and, and they'll become a different person, okay? When, when, when the wrong thing controls you, okay? So if a person has too much to drink, they let that control them, then people go, oh, wow, look at look what that person's doing. I would never would have believed that this person, I never would have believed Judy Maxim up on a, with a lampstand over her head. You know, no, no, I'm just teasing Judy, she's not here. But the idea is you understand that when people uh, have too much to drink, the alcohol controls them, and they do things maybe that they would never have done before. And people recognize that, and they see that. Well, the Apostle Paul then uses that analogy. That's really not a prohibition against drinking alcohol, not that passage of Scripture. But what it is is it's an encouragement to allow, just as something else might control your life, let the Holy Spirit control your life. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Let the Holy Spirit fill you and lead you. See, he was, Barnabas was noted as a Spirit-filled man. He was shaped and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And other people could see it in his life. It came out. People could see the evidence of the filling and the control of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it says in another passage in Acts, it says, For instance, there was Joseph, one of the apostles, nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. There's his word, son of encouragement, consolation. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned, and he brought money to the apostles. See, he was generous. His life showed generosity because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The apostle Paul would later write uh, to those in Corinth and in 2 Corinthians. He talked about how their life was an example, how their life was like, like they were like living out the word of God to other people. Paul says, clearly, he says, you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is not written with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. And so what we're saying is that when the Holy Spirit is in your heart and guiding you and controlling you, it shows up and it sees and people recognize your life as being controlled by God. So what you, ha what you have in you shows up and indicates who's guiding you and where you have been. Now, another story. Michelle and I, when our boys were growing up in school, uh, particularly uh, our last two, um, we got to a point in our life where we decided to do the uh, end of the summer Mackinac vacation. And we would go north, and we would sometimes stay on the St. Ignace side, and we'd go into the UP. You know, many of you have probably done that, uh, gone up to Whitefish Point or seen to Quantum Falls, you know. So, but we found on a regular basis that people in the Upper Peninsula have an interesting, different type of humor about them. Um, I found this, and so I, I, I'm going to share it with you. This is, this is what they have wrote up there in the UP. Um, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources is advising hikers, hunters, and cross-country skiers to take extra precautions and be alert for wolves and coyotes while in the Upper Peninsula. We advise that people wear noise-making devices such as little bells on their clothing to alert the wolves that you are coming. We also advise you to carry pepper spray in case of an encounter with a wolf. It's also good, uh, a good idea to watch for fresh signs of wolf activity. People should recognize the difference between wolf droppings and coyote droppings. Coyote droppings are smaller, contain berries and possibly squirrel and rabbit fur. Wolf droppings have little bells in them and smell like pepper. <laughs> what you have in you shows up what's outside, it shows up outside of you and it shows where you have been, all right? So let's get, let's get this right. Now Barnabas was a good man, wholeness, integrity, did the right thing. Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was so much in his life people could see it outwardly where he had been. And thirdly, Barnabas was a man full of faith, of faith, faith in God. I learned this song growing up, maybe some of you did too, faith is just believing what God says he will do. He will never fail us, his promises are true. If we but believe him, his children we become. Faith is just believing this wondrous thing God has done. The Bible is full of passages about what faith is. Hebrews says in Hebrews 11:1. 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.6 6 says, For without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he re rewards those who earnestly or dil diligently seek him. Faith in God, faith 
faith-filled people. Barnabas, I believe, was a faith-filled man. The scriptures say he was. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. He was a positive person. He believed in people and he believed in God. He went to see what was going on in the church that, that now not just Jews but Gentiles were coming to the Lord. And Barnabas was behind that totally. He had such faith in God. He was a positive person. So another story about being a positive person. There was this African king and he had a friend and they would always go hunting together. And the friend was always so positive, the friend would say, this is good. And so uh, one time, uh, they were going to go on a hunting trip. The friend had loaded the king's gun, and he did it incorrectly. And so when the king, uh, out on the hunting expedition, fired, it blew off his thumb. And the friend said, this is good. And the, the king says, how can this be good? No thumb, this is not good. And he takes and he puts him in prison because he's so mad at him. And the friend says, this is good. Well, about a year passes, and the king is now out on another hunting expedition, and they've run across some, can uh, some cannibals, and they've been captured by these cannibals. And the cannibals are going to, they're tying them to the stake, they're getting the fire because they're going to eat them because they're cannibals. But they notice the king doesn't have a thumb, he's got a thumb missing. And for them, that's bad. He's not whole. And, they, and they're according to their custom. They can't sacrifice. They can't eat anything that's not whole. That's bad. And so they let him go. And the king thinks about his friend, you know. And so he goes back to his friend, and he releases him from prison. He says, oh, I'm so sorry. He says, you've been here for a year. And the friend says, this is good. He says, how can you say this is good? You've been wrongly in prison for over a year. And the servant said, because... If I had not been in prison, I would have been with you on that expedition. <laughs> he was a positive person. You know, glass is filled to overflowing. That's how Barnabas was, just full of faith in God. And, and I really believe that faith-filled people are positive people. But not only, and then it translates down into being, having faith in people. And that's what Barnabas did. Barnabas had faith in God, but he also had faith in people. Paul. He used to be Saul, the persecutor of Christians. But God got into his life and changed him, and he became Paul, the great apostle who wrote 12 or 13 books of the New Testament. And, and yet when Paul first, early on in his ministry, when he went to out and about, people saw him, and they thought, no, that's Saul, that's a persecutor. And they didn't want anything to do with him. But Barnabas saw that, his ministry, that, that Paul's ministry was genuine. He believed in Paul. He took Paul to the apostles and vouched for him. Barnabas thought the best about people. Sometimes I'm just really amazed at what we are willing <clears throat> to believe about people. We, are, we tend to believe the rumor. We tend to believe the bad report, the gossip. It amazes me sometimes at what we're willing to believe about people rather than thinking the best about people. And Barnabas thought the best. Another story. Uh, it was in, after Abraham Lincoln had passed away, there was a rumor that someone had stole the body of Lincoln. And so, a Senate investigated hearing was conducted. Lincoln's family was contacted against the wishes of Lincoln's family. The body was exhumed, only to find Lincoln was right where he should have been. A number of years later, believe it or not, Another rumor circulated that someone had taken the body of Abraham Lincoln. Another Senate investigative committee. And again, when they exhumed, they found Lincoln to be right where he was at. But you see, believing rumors and the bad report drove a nation, our nation, to foolishness. But Barnabas believed the best about Paul. Barnabas is an encourager. He's a good man. He's full of the Holy Spirit, and he's filled with faith in God and faith in other people, thinking the best, non-judgmental, encouraging, reaching out, lifting others up. And as I shared at the outset of my message, I mean, that, that was my vision statement that I had to write for my life, is I wanted to be an encouraging person. I want to be like Barnabas. I want to be a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. I want to be a person who lifts people up. A man fell into a pit, 
and he couldn't get himself out. A subjective person came along and said, I feel for you down there. An objective person came along and said, it's only logical that someone would have fallen into the pit. A Christian scientist said, came along and said, only a bad person would have fallen into the pit. A newspaper reporter wanted a story on the pit. A fundamentalist said, you deserve your pit. A Calvinist said, if you had been saved, you never would have fallen in that pit. An Arminian said, you were saved and you still fell in that pit. A charismatic said, just confess you're not in the pit. A realist came along and said, now that's a pit. The IRS man came along and wanted to pay tax, wanted to find out if he could pay taxes on the pit. An evasive person came along and avoided the subject of the pit altogether. A self-pitied person came along and said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. An optimist said things could be worse. A pessimist said things can't be worse. But Jesus, seeing the man in the pit, reached down and took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit. And I think that's our job, is to encourage people, to lift people up, to have faith in God, to be positive, and to have faith in people. Former General and President Dwight Eisenhower said, I follow this example by trusting God and by thinking about the best about others. Barnabas was a good man. He had wholeness. He had integrity. Barnabas was filled with the Holy Spirit. What was in him came outside and people knew where he walked and who led him. And Barnabas had faith. He was positive. He had faith in God and he had faith in people. And my word to you today is I pray that will be true of us as well. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share your word this morning. I pray, God, that you will help us all to be good people, filled with the Holy Spirit, and of faith. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.